Now, let's talk in this video about uh, what happens when we have a column and instead of having a kind of completely center, you know, load along the uh, longitudinal axis of the column, you know, we have certain value or certain eccentricity. So this means that, you know, like in this case, as it is presented, kind of maybe this is exaggerated, uh, but, you know, it is understood that, you know, if you have, for example, this case where you have a pin-free uh, column and then, you know, the force is not aligned with the center of the column, but it's, you know, a little bit a distance, you know, away from it, then you might call it that it's an eccentric loading. So that's fine. But kind of this is exaggerated, but I want to let you know is that, you know, if we look at the beam from the top, let's imagine that this is the cross section of the beam. So when we talk about eccentricity in these cases, you know, we're talking about, you know, a small distance, a distance away from the center of the column, the centroidal axis of the column, you know, but at least a small distance away. So not that far away, but, you know, a small distance away. So what happens then? So how this, the distance, how this change in the point of application of the force influences the, let's say, the behavior of the column, you know, in buckling and in, in kind of in compression. So now for this case, uh, to, to get to that transplosion, so we're going to take, you know, a column, and we're going to assume that, you know, if we see in this case here, that we have, you know, the column and we have the force applied at a certain distance E from the center of the column. Well, this should be about, you know, here, but let's assume that it's a very, say, cylinder column. And then when I apply the form, I expect the column to deform in this way, kind of like this. So, as in the case of the Euler formula, to start with the whole, let's say, study of this and to get to the conclusion of what's the effect and how can we introduce these effects into our column formulation. So we have that, for example, uh, at any point, if I take these references, and it's a little bit weird, but, you know, just bear with me, uh, that we have y in the horizontal axis and x, you know, pointing down. So any point or at any point in the, let's say, in the length of the column, I would have a deformation y. Let's call it that way, a deformation y. And this deformation y, or because of this deformation y, I will have a moment, you know, around this point here. So let's, let's think in this way that the moment is going to be something like, let me change this, something like this. All right. So this moment can be calculated by multiplying the force times, you know, that the distance, you know, from the center of application of the force to the deformed state or point of the beam of the column, in this case, uh, just to make a differentiation that columns are vertical and beams are horizontal, but it depends on the loading case. So we have the moment now, if we consider that the deflections are small, as we did in the Euler case, then we could apply, you know, the formula, you know, the deformation formula for this case. So now, uh, when I substitute, you know, uh, what's the value of the moment into this formula that I have right here, then I will find a second degree differential equation that has the same shape as the one we had in the Euler's case. So this is kind of, you know, we're not doing anything, let's say, different here. Now, if I start doing a lot of, let's say, modifications and changes about, you know, uh, how things are going to go, as in the case of the Euler formulation, I have here that, you know, uh, that the solution to this uh, second degree differential equation is going to be this one, you know, uh, where the task uh, is, or the, the, the next task is to find out what are the values of the constants A and B resulting from the integration process, okay? This is also pretty similar to Euler's formulation. So we can refer back to that if we need more information. Now, in this case, we have, you know, a, a little bit different con uh, boundary conditions to find these constants A and B. So the boundary conditions are, uh, should I break? no, okay, is, are kind of, you know, for, for example, when X is equal to zero, I'm going to have that the Y, or the distance, you know, to the point of application of the force is going to be E. So meaning if I'm kind of here, X equal to zero, then this is going to correspond to this boundary condition. And when I substitute this boundary condition, let's say terms x equals zero and y equal e into this formula, I'm going to find out that b equals e. So that's straight away. Now, the second boundary condition that I might have here is that in the center of the bar, just right here, let's say L, L divided by two, the center of the bar, 
So the deformation or the, the slope of the deformation is zero, meaning that, you know, uh, this is going to be, the slope is going to be something like this, you know, straight. Then substituting these boundary conditions into the formula and taking into consideration that B equals E, then I'm going to find out after the various mathematical manipulation that A equals to this term here in the bottom right. Please check it out. Uh, try to you know, go step by step uh, about the mathematical derivation of everything. It's pretty interesting, actually, and it's not complicated. And uh, one thing of doing it, kind of a part of it, is that if you have a different configuration, you could apply the same concepts to find out you know, your constants in this case. Now, remember, we're talking about a, a different condition uh, or attachment condition of the column to the, to the outer wall or the rest of the wall, for example. In this case, we are talking about having a pin-ended column. Uh, so pin columns in both ends. So it means that if I have a free, uh, free fixed condition or fixed fixed condition, then this is going to change. But the concept underlying what was done here uh, apply also, you know, to find out what are the values of the constants in those conditions. Then working a little bit more, we're going to have that uh, in this case, yes, that you know uh, something interesting. Let me bring down the ruler. First, that I can now formulate the equation for the deformation of the column, you know, having finding out the constants A and B. And this is laid out here. Kind of, this is the constant for the deformation. Why this deformation is important for me? It's because, you know, for sure, is we're talking that buckling might be a problem or an issue. I need to know what's going to be the maximum deformation I'm going to have in this column due to the load applied at a certain distance from the longitudinal axis. So by considering that, you know, the maximum deformation is going to be located in the middle of the beam, then, you know, substituting the middle of the beam as, you know, as, as variable x, then I can find that the maximum deformation is going to be represented by this equation here, this formula here, trigonometric formula. Fine. Now, What's the purpose of now knowing? What, what, what do I do with that information about, you know, the maximum deformation? So now, if I know that this is going to have the maximum deformation, then I could calculate the maximum moment produced in the column by applying a force, you know, at a distance from the longitudinal axis. Using the maximum deformation and using the force and then the distance, I can find then, you know, well, the maximum deformation and the force, I can find what's the maximum moment that I have there. And now you know what's coming next. So if I have the maximum moment, and then I have, a, a, let's say, I know uh, where are the, the section properties of the column, then I could calculate where, where is kind of the maximum stress that you're going to find in the column. So and let's remember that the stress in at any part of the column is going to be formed by a combination of the direct stress caused by the force. That's a compressive stress, you know. Uh, it might be compressive, you know, in that sense. Well, it is compressive, definitely. And, you know, and the stress caused by the, mo by the moment, which is kind of that maximum moment you found, times, you know, the Z, which is the distance from the outer, let's say, part of the section to the, to the neutral axis, and, you know, the moment of inertia. When you substitute all of these terms, you're going to find out, well, I'll do a little bit of rearrangement. You're going to find out that, let's go forward, that uh, the maximum moment that that is going to be found in this column is can be represented by this formula here. Again, a little bit of rearrangement here, meaning that you know uh, sigma maximum, uh, it can be equated to the allowable stress or the permissible stress that you find you know according to the material, and then p divided by a is going to be the working stress. Let's put it in that way. So if I do a little bit of rearrangement here, I'm going to find out you know that the recommended or permissible working stress should be equal, less or equal than this term here. And this here, this equation here, this well, this formula here is known as the second formula. You're going to find it in the textbooks as a second formula, where the term here, E times C, you know, the eccentricity times the distance from the outer layer to the neutral axis, you know, divided by the radius of gyration square, you know, 
that's going to be known as the, as the eccentricity ratio. And, and this is important because of something. If I take this a little bit step further, so if I'm not just happy with just knowing how to calculate uh, the effect of a force eccentrically applied uh, using the second formula, if and then I plot, you know, what are the consequences of this eccentricity on, on, a, on a column, I'm going to have here an interesting phenomenon. So first, uh, I have here the Euler's formulation, which is uh, uh, described by the blue hyperbola. And then we, I have the orange line here, which follows the Rankine's formula, which we have seen in a previous video. And then these green dashed lines are the results of applying the second formula for different values of eccentricity. Look at this. So this, for example, this first line here represents the results of this formula by having a 0 0.2 eccentricity ratio. And it means that if I have just, you know, if I start having or applying the force eccentrically, I'm starting reducing the maximal permissible load that I, that, that, col that column can handle. So for 0 0.2, imagine this, if I have a column kind of in this range here, let me just draw a vertical line in here. Trying to get it to 90. Imagine here. And I have a column with this slenderness. Rachel. If I would apply the force centrically, you know, then, you know, let's assume that we could, we're going to use the Euler formulation and then kind of combine with, combine with the with the compressive strength of the material. So if I have applied this load centrically, then, you know, my maximum bearing load suggests is going to be this. Now, if I apply it eccentrically, then, you know, it's reduced to this. So it changes from from as a stress value, it changes from 280 something like that that I plotted here to 200 and you know 30 something here. So it starts to you know penalizing the maximum amount of load that you can you know put in the on the column. So and of course if the eccentricity increases, then you know the the capability of bearing load of the column reduces tremendously, like you're seeing here. Interesting fact is that you know by the end by in long columns for example you're going to find that the, these values converge towards you know the, the results of the Euler formula that's pretty interesting so now you need to use it if you want to if you want to calculate the possible working load or, or the critical load that you could use in a column which has a load uh, applied eccentrically then okay this is one way to do it using the second formula and you know, kind of to make things a little bit more real about how do they look like. For example, if we take a, a kind of this I profile, you know, IPE profile, and uh, well, these are the dimensions of that profile: uh, the height, you know, the width, and then the, the thicknesses of the you know of the internal elements of the web. They call it then some values of of, uh, of radius of gyration and area. Then, if I say that I'm going to apply a load, just to kind of to, to have a, a very concrete example of what would be an eccentricity ratio in this case of 0 0.2. So if I calculate, you know, with this 0 0.2 and using the properties of this profile, what would be the distance of application of the load if I if I say that there is a, an eccentrically applied load with an eccentricity ratio of 0 0.2, then you know, doing a little bit of my calculation, I can find that you know an eccentricity of 0 0.2 means that the load is applied, you know close to 20, centi 20 millimeters you know, away from the neutral axis. And then let's consider that in this case, the weak, you know, let's call it the like weak axis, you know, is kind of, or this is more probable, or this profile, using this profile as a column, will most probably fail around, you know, by buckling around the Z axis. Then, you know, if I apply this, this value to this example, then it would be equivalent to applying the load here instead of here in the center of the, of the column. So just physically imagine that, you know, instead of applying the column, the, the load here, you just move it a little bit, you know, to the kind of in the center of this, um, of, of this distance here, the half of the, of the, of this width B, then, you know, you would have an eccentricity of 0 0.2, which would reduce tremendously the very low capacity of the column. Then, uh, as you mentioned, as you see here, well, this is a description for eccentricity in kind of if a simple eccentricity, let's call it, uh, when you have eccentricity just applied uh, along one axis. But what happens when you have eccentricity applied, you know, or let's say, yeah, eccentricity 
along you know two axes or with respect to two axes like you know shown here you don't have it you know, either here or here but you have it somewhere in between so uh, there is an experiment done you know and one of the things that is working or you could use to that is you know a, a variation of rankings formula taking into consideration both eccentricities and you know this is represented uh, by this uh, formula here and, and look at this so you have rankings formula which is this first part here and then you have the effect of the eccentricity meaning that you are putting something in the denominator here which is reducing uh, the bearing capacity load of the column now you're going to find here okay i have a radius of gyration here but i also have a couple of radius of, of gyration you know along with respect to the y and x axis so which one is this uh, that doesn't have any subscript or anything well this is the minimum radius of gyration that you have in the in the application it could be ky k sub y or it could be k sub x but it's the minimum one that's why it's left open but you know when considering an eccentric loading load using rankings formula then you know we need to take into account you know, how far away they are from the from the kind of natural axis of the column well uh i will close the eccentric load here and uh and then you know we will see in the next video what's going to happen with uh for example the procedure general procedure to calculate you know columns to to design columns and we will talk a little bit in another video also about why columns fail which is pretty interesting thanks for for hanging out with me